Well, welcome back for day two. Uh, we had uh, an exciting and, and lively group of panels yesterday. Um, so the bar has been set high for today's panels. Um, I'm just going to introduce the moderator of the first panel today and, uh, and let her take it away. Um, you know, we heard trade came up in I think almost every panel yesterday, certainly in the wages panel and the skills panel. And I think it's really, you know, understanding the role that, that trade has played um, in all of the issues that we're talking about yesterday and today is, is critically important. So um, we thought it was important to have a, a trade panel as part of the discussions. Here to lead that panel is Beth Balsan. Uh, she's a fellow at the Open Markets Institute and focuses on the impact of monopoly power on trade and its consequences for national security. Beth has a, a deep background in trade policy. She uh, <coughs> served as Democratic Counsel to the House Ways and Means Subcommittee. Uh, she was also Associate General Counsel at USTR. She's worked on TPP. She's worked on WTO issues, um, so she knows her stuff. Uh, Beth, also, I mentioned the focus on the impact of monopoly power, and that's another theme that I think was present in a lot of the discussions yesterday. So look forward to this discussion. Take it away, Beth. Um, I'm just going to introduce folks quickly in alphabetical order. Um, we'll start with Kathy Feingold. She's a leading advocate on global workers' rights issues. She's director of the AFL-CIO's international, international Department. She's a committed and passionate advocate, strategic campaigner, and policy expert. In 2018, she was elected deputy president of the International Trade Union Confederation, the organization representing 200 million unionized workers worldwide. She brings more than 20 years of experience in trade and global economic policy and worker, human, and women's rights issues. Her work in both global and grassroots flora reflect her commitment to strengthening the voice of working people in global policy debates. Here we've got uh, Professor Joel Paul. He's the Albert Abramson Professor of Law at the University of California Hastings Law School, where he teaches and writes about international trade law and policy and constitutional law. He's the author of books and articles on trade policy and economic regulation. Most recently, he published a critically acclaimed biography of Chief Justice John Marshall entitled, Without Precedent, Chief Justice John Marshall and His Times. He's also taught on the law faculties of UC Berkeley, Yale, Leiden University, University of Connecticut, and American. And we've got also Brad Setzer. He's the Stephen A. Tannenbaum Senior Fellow for International Economics at the Council on Foreign Relations. He previously served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Economic Analysis in U.S. Treasury and on the staff of the National Economic Council in the Obama Administration. His expertise includes macroeconomics, global capital and trade flows, financial vulnerability analysis, and sovereign debt restructuring. He regularly blogs at Follow the Money. Um, so when it comes to trade, I find it's always helpful to start with big picture discussion. Um, and I think the way I've been doing trade for almost 25 years now, and I think there's a general sense that trade is a good thing, but where the conversation gets bogged down is in the actual execution of globalization. And because we have this affinity for trade as a good thing, sometimes we aren't able to have a very constructive conversation about how the global trading system is structured. What a lot of people don't know in my experience is how integral the labor movement was in supporting trade for many, many decades, right up until the Trade Act of 1974. And I'm wondering, Kathy, if we could start with you and you could talk a little bit about what happened so that labor's position changed. Great, thanks so much. Absolutely, I think that first it's, uh, you know, it's great to be on a panel where finally we have a lot of people really thinking about the labor issues. Um, the labor movement was indeed supportive post-World War II. We had the Havana Charter, labor was front and center. And I think workers really saw that trade was working for them. Productivity was linked to wages, it was working. Um, what really happened was when that rupture happened and when um, trade was no longer just about tariffs, it was around non-tariff issues, we saw the trade agenda expanding, we saw the delinking of productivity and wages, and workers said, this isn't working for us anymore. Um, and I think we also saw that, you know, post-World War II, the Bretton Woods system was built with some understanding that you needed, um, you know, good industrial relations, right? <laughs> the, the wars had, had shown that to us. You know, World War I brought us the ILO, 1919, World War II, people said we need to get this right. So I think we had that, that sweet spot where workers saw this uh, as working for them, and then when it stopped, and as you said, post-1974, um, people started questioning, what is the model, and what what is the intention of trade? Um, and I think that's the question that I think we're, we're, we're asking here today. 
Great, and so we, we often talk about labor and environment together. It's not necessarily well known that the Havana Charter, which never came to be, but in 1948 provided for enforceable labor standards. So we should have had enforceable labor standards from the very dawn of the multilateral trading system as we know it today. So it's not like labor's a new issue or something that came up when NAFTA was being passed. So labor and environment are the issues that get arbitraged, and, and that's sort of the, the, the larger issue is the way we've um, allowed free flow of capital, uh, and the free flow of capital in the absence of having rules on labor and the environment has allowed them to be arbitraged down. So Joel, you've given us a paper that addresses the issue of arbitrage and proposes a solution for it. So could you talk about that a little bit? Sure, uh, is, is this on? This is on, right? I don't have to press the button? No, okay, great. Uh, the, um, the basic problem that we've seen is that the international agreements that we've negotiated I have in them labor and environment standards, but the standards aren't enforceable. They're not enforceable fundamentally because what we're relying on is the goodwill of the exporting country. It seems to me that we have a system in place uh, which deals with the problem of social dumping. Uh, we, when I talk about social dumping, what I mean is that when we're importing goods that are produced by workers that are not paid fair wages or that are produced in ways that are not sustainable, uh, uh, we are importing more than those goods. We are also importing those social problems. We are allowing the conditions for regulatory competition. Uh, and in order to counter that, what we need to be able to do is for the importing country to be able to levy a, a tax which would raise the cost of those imports to what they would have been if workers were paid fair wages and if they were produced in ways which were sustainable. So what I've proposed in my paper is that we use our existing uh, dumping duties, our anti-dumping duties, uh, and we use the existing uh, 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 apparatus for that um, to impose a duty against social dumping. And this could be calculated in a way which would take into consideration the differences in the cost of living in different countries, the difference in the circumstances of different countries, um, but would uh, attempt to uh, try to create a kind of floor uh, which would allow countries to compete more equitably uh, in, uh, in international markets. It could be done either in terms of an addition to our existing trade agreements. Uh, we could make it a, a, um, a condition for which other countries can have access to our markets, or we could do it in terms of trying to uh, create a new kind of WTO, a WTO which actually took responsibility for the labor and environmental social costs that uh, trade uh, creates. Great, thank you. Um, the third area that gets arbitraged that we don't really talk about in our trade agreements with the exception of Panama is tax. And Brad, you've done a lot of work on tax arbitrage. Can you talk to us about tax, trade, how they interact, how the arbitrage works? I guess, to me, one of the striking ways of thinking about this, to start to think about this, uh, comes from the observation that over the past 25 years, broadly speaking, uh, there's been no growth in U.S. exports of manufacturers or agricultural goods as a share of U.S. GDP. So when we talk about globalization, you might think that globalization would have led to the production of goods for global markets to account over time for a larger share of our economy. It hasn't. There's been some growth in services as a uh, share, uh, services exports as a share of uh, our uh, external output. There's certainly been some growth in our imports of goods. But where the really spectacular growth has come is in the offshore profits of U.S. firms. Yep. Mm. The bulk of the gains from globalization, setting aside the gains from more diverse consumption goods, lower, cheaper import prices, but the bulk of the gains to the make it here or design it here part of the economy have come in the form of offshore profits, not exports. And then when you look at the distribution of offshore profits, you discover that 60% of the offshore profit is booked 
in seven low tax jurisdictions. So what we have broadly speaking today is a world where the most successful US companies have a design it here, typically make it abroad, certainly make enough high value components abroad so that your tax base is abroad, and then assign your intellectual property to the lowest tax jurisdiction globally. So one and a half percent of US GDP and offshore profits is now from these low tax jurisdictions. How does it interact with trade? Well, what is one of the most important U.S. asks typically in a trade negotiation? Well, it's stronger protection for pharmaceutical products. Right? Do pharmaceutical companies, by and large, have a produce it in the U.S. to sell it to the rest of the world model? The answer is no. The trade deficit in pharmaceuticals now is as large as our trade surplus in aircraft. We are on net a major importer of chemically active molecules. So what we are in practice negotiating hardest for, in many cases, are firms that have a model of producing in Ireland or Singapore or similar jurisdictions, booking the profits abroad, uh, and in some cases selling it back to the US, in other cases it's selling it to other countries. If that's the model by which uh, globalization plays out, it doesn't seem to me very surprising that the gains from globalization end up being very concentrated. So I think we should be thinking perhaps a little bit about what we negotiate for in trade agreements, but also thinking a lot about the provisions of our old tax code and the provisions of our new tax code that have created lower taxes on firms that offshore both their intellectual property and their production. Um, <clears throat> that's a really good segue into a discussion about China because whenever we've got a trade agreement that is pending and needs to be passed, principally what we talk about is exports. And I think you, we need it for export competitiveness. All we ever talk about is export competitiveness. We do an inadequate job of discussing what the potential consequences might be on the import side and the consequences for labor. And we've seen, as Joel has explained, um, we actually don't have an effective regime right now to address labor and environmental arbitrage. So maybe just to level set on China, the euphoria in the 90s was end of history. Um, and not just you know, democracy will flourish, but also capitalism will flourish. And the understanding was that China would join the WTO and it would be a democratizing influence and they would naturally become a market economy. And there are currently, of course, a lot of questions about how that's turned out. Um, getting back to this issue of letting China into the WTO and only focusing on the export side, Kathy, can you talk a little bit about the China shock, the work that economists have done to address our miscalculation on that. Absolutely. I mean, the China shock had an enormous impact on working people. And I would say, you know, just from one other piece of the puzzle of, of what changed since the 70s is worker bargaining power, right? And so you have to see that also as part of the China shock because for people who understand China, you also understand that there is not the bargaining power in China. You have the All China Federation of Trade Unions. You don't have an independent trade union movement. So you had this problem for Chinese workers as well that as productivity was rising in China, they had no mechanism for bargaining, for being able to get a greater share of that. And so you had this, you know, a decrease here in the United States where workers weren't able to be bargaining and you had a decrease in, in China. And so the whole impact has been problematic um, for workers here in the United States and around the world is setting, I would say, you know, a, a super low floor upon which um, workers are trying to bargain, which is why your idea of, you know, needing to raise that floor um, and getting some sort of living minimum wages into our trade discussion is so critical. But I do want to bring the, bar the collective bargaining because you want to create a floor upon which you're bargaining. Right now, uh, you have people, if they have a little bit of bargaining power, are actually bargaining from a place of poverty. And so you spend all your capital bargaining just to get yourself up to here and you're still not at a living wage. So we really need to look at the power issue with China and I think that's often not part of the discussion. Enormous shock, it was the same, you know, we had a huge shock after the Cold War as well. You had all these 
workers entering the global economy. Whoops. Um, so, and that was the water shock. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, so I think that's a, a, a big piece of what we need to look at in, in addition to, you know, its impact on manufacturing and what it's done to, to working people here, their inability to continue to get uh, part of the gains of productivity. And just to add to that, um, one of the issues with TPP was trying to devise labor rules for Vietnam, which is a one-party state that believes it represents the workers and that the, the rules we think of as supporting labor aren't necessary. So to the extent TPP was a prerequisite for what we would want to do with China, can you just give us a brief comment on, on how that works? So, you know, sure, I think there was a lot of hope. And I, I just want to be clear that Vietnam is different than China. And so you have the Vietnamese, gen uh, the VGCL, uh, General Confederation of Labor. Um, and so we had, there was a whole discussion around TPP and, and creating benchmarks that they would meet and passing, ratifying freedom of association at the ILO. But you also have seen, you know, it, it lies in the hands and it's about political will in, in Vietnam. And so you saw one step forward and a few steps back in terms of their commitment and really letting independent trade unions flourish in Vietnam. Um, so I think it's a huge lesson. I, I, you know, I would think you would see more improvement in Vietnam first than you will in China in terms of an opening up. You're seeing a little bit in Vietnam, some ratifications of international labor standards. Um, they say, if you talk to them, that they're allowing independent unions to form uh, locally. It needs to be happening at the sectoral level so that workers actually have power in sectors um, and that you don't have the ability of, you know, the arbitrage system to, you know, everybody running back, back and forth between uh, the lowest wages. And so you need both of those countries to be dealing with worker power um, and, and the ability to raise wages. Um, and Brad, you, you sort of hinted at what we're negotiating with the Chinese. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on what you think we should be targeting, what the administration is doing, and where we should be focused. So China is, you know, there's the challenge uh, that was created by the surge in Chinese imports uh, after China's WTO accession, uh, which we did not handle well. The, impact was wildly underestimated and the response at the time was timid and tools that were available to try to manage that shock were not used including the special 421 so there was a, a series of errors the challenge i think we face now is actually a little bit different in the sense that uh, the china shock I mean, there are future possible china shocks but the intense growth in U.S. imports from China has slowed. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is how can we create a framework where American companies and American workers can do better in China. And that poses uh, a significant challenge in the following sense. The easy deals, to the extent that there are any easy deals for China, tend to be deals that allow American companies to set up shop in China with more or less protection of their intellectual property and produce in China for the Chinese market. The hard deals, and there are almost, there are very few concrete examples, are cases where it is possible for a US or a European or a Japanese or a Chinese company to produce in the US for sale to the Chinese market. I think the negotiating focus should be on the hard deals, making it possible to produce in the US and sell to China, not simply on strengthening protections for those companies that set up shop in China and are producing for the Chinese market. Some of the concrete ways I think that would manifest itself is that I think it would mean paying more attention to covert by China policies. Um, now, in some cases, these by China policies aren't explicit. I am pretty confident China never set out in a document that could be presented as evidence at the WTO a requirement that its state airlines buy China's indigenous uh, aircraft, the C919. I am equally confident that all the CEOs of the major state-owned Chinese airlines believe that they ha have to buy uh, a certain number of China's indigenous 
It's not a formal trade barrier, but it acts to impede the ability of U.S. firms to produce in the U.S. and sell to China. Uh, you can go through other industrial sectors, uh, medical equipment. There are very explicit by China type provisions that mean that you really have to, at a minimum, produce in China. And at a maximum, if you really want to succeed, produce in China with a Chinese partner, which gives rise to these intellectual property protections. The difficulty, to be honest, with an agenda that is much more focused on the uh, design it here and make it here products, rather than the design it here and accept the reality that if you want to sell in China, you got to make it there uh, products, is that the deal space shrinks. And so you have to be willing, I think, to live with that uh, recognition and that the consequences of that. One of the issues that has surfaced under the administration, particularly with China, and this is a segue back to some of your ideas, Joel, is how we treat developing countries. So there's a fight right now over whether China should be treated as if it's a developing country. Uh, and then there's a, this is a particularly challenging issue for progressives who don't wanna see a battle between our workers and their workers. We don't wanna take jobs from them that, um, through comparative advantage might, might be appropriately located there. How do we thread this needle? You talked a little bit about false comparative advantage. I talked a little bit about false comparative advantage. Help us think through how we can manage the, looking out for workers here and also looking out for workers sure. in developing uh, countries. So I, when, uh, when Ricardo wrote about comparative advantage in the 19th century, uh, what he imagined was that comparative advantage was something which was natural, which was immutable, which was a part of a society, like the climate or the, or the geography. Um, what we have today is a situation in which the regulatory differences, what I call the regulatory gap between advanced industrialized economies and other economies, confers on other countries a kind of constructed comparative advantage, a kind of an artificial comparative advantage. And we find ourselves competing against our own regulatory standards. Uh, so that is a problem. And, and, and to get back to uh, the point that Kathy raised, uh, when we're talking about um, disparity of income, uh, disparity of income in the world <laughs> it is a threat to us. It's, it's a security threat as well as an economic threat to us. The threat, um, you know, we see in our own country a backlash that has occurred because of the impact that trade has had on some communities, uh, the fact that so many people have been left behind by international trade. What we see in the world today is 69% uh, of the world's population is sharing 3% of the world's wealth, while 1% of the world's population has 40% of the world's wealth. There are 168 million children between the ages of four and 17 who are now employed, who are, who are working. Um, in a world in which that kind of disparity of wealth exists, we have to expect that the kind of extreme nationalism we have seen on the rise in the United States and in Europe is going to spread. That is not a safe world, that's not a secure world. If we wanna create a world that is, uh, that is secure for America and for American interests, a world in which we have uh, export markets that are open to our products. We need to have a world in which other people in other countries are able to be paid a living wage, are able to, uh, are able to uh, have standards that are consistent with sustainability so that we can preserve our climate. And so those are, those are concerns which are international concerns, but they're also domestic concerns that are essential to our own security and to our own economic health. And just to tease out some of the details of what you've proposed, because I think they matter. For your regime, we're not talking about imposing U.S. standards no. on developing countries. No. You're trying to measure the arbitrage. Right. Is that fair? Exactly, yeah. So, so what I'm proposing is to say that we define something like a living wage. We say that you know, workers have to be paid enough in a 40-hour week that they can afford to uh, uh, pay for housing and, and food and clothing for their family of four, for example. Um, and of course, it's going to be very different in different countries. And every country, in my model, would have its would, would 
could set its own rate. They could decide what they think a living wage would be in China. Um, and if a US uh, a co uh, a company that was competing with Chinese imports felt that um, it was not a living wage, it did not meet a living wage standard, they could challenge that. The Department of Commerce, just as the Par Department of Commerce uh, uh, looks at uh, imports now and tries to decide what a normal value is, the uh, Department of Commerce could investigate, and could make a determination, and if, if China contested, if China felt that a living wage was not fair, we could have some sort of a, a bilateral commission that could, that could ma make some kind of a judgment about that. So uh, I, I think that, that there's a very practical way to accomplish this uh, that is consistent with our existing uh, uh, dumping uh, duty laws uh, and also consistent uh, with the GATT. Can you elaborate a little bit on why you think it's consistent with the GATT? Sure. Um, I think it's consistent with the GATT in two ways. Uh, one is that if, well, specifically, <laughs> it's consistent with the GATT in this respect. That to the extent that we have free trade agreements, if we're negotiating uh, a, a, a trade relationship with the Pacific Rim countries, for instance, um, we can include in a free trade agreement uh, other provisions so long as they don't raise the barriers to trade to, to countries outside of the free trade agreement. That's permissible uh, under, under GATT. Um, alternatively, I think one can make a fair argument uh, that uh, it is a question of public morals. The GATT uh, under Article 20 allows uh, for countries to establish uh, policies uh, that are necessary to, pr to protect public morals. One of those public morals, I think, is guaranteeing that workers get paid a living wage and guaranteeing that we are producing goods in a way that is not damaging uh, our global environment. Um, so you raise an interesting point with GATT. So one of uh, my previous jobs at USTR was litigating WTO disputes. And I defended the Department of Commerce at the WTO on trade remedies. And in my experience, and I've written about this, the WTO has a fundamental bias against trade remedies. And I think this is the area when people are talking about overreach at the WTO and the, why the administration is strangling the appellate body. And these were bipartisan concerns. Uh, Obama had them, Bush had them. Um, there's a real concern, and a larger concern really, that because the WTO's preoccupation is with liberalizing trade flows, that their bias is in favor of liberalizing trade flows and that they take a negative view generally towards any action that's designed to remedy the kinds of issues you're talking about. So I would like to ask each of you whether it's in the interest of progressives who believe generally that the WTO rules are pro-corporate, that they're inadequately representative of labor and environmental issues, are we better off not fixing the broken WTO dispute settlement system and giving ourselves the room to try to address some of these issues where we're not going to be challenged or face trade sanctions as we experiment with how to address these problems? I'll jump into that. Um, I mean, I think the reality is we're in this moment where our multilateral system, even beyond the WTO, is not fit for purpose. And so if what we're trying to say is we need to take a pause here about trade policy, what are our objectives, it's about perhaps, you know, not perhaps, but definitely about, you know, dealing with wages, the, uh, uh, you know, dignity on the job, sustainability, uh, the climate piece. We have a paper here from Sandra Pulaski and, uh, that deals with that. How are we going to deal with the accord, uh, you know, implementing some of that without some changes? So I think this is a great moment um, to be rethinking that this system isn't fit for purpose. What we have been doing, and all of us have been doing it, is tweaking the models that haven't delivered, right? We're tweaking the neoliberal trade models. We're, we're tweaking them to make them a little bit better. And as I remind people, you can tweak the heck out of, out of NAFTA, and it is still not really going to deliver unless um, you have a whole bunch of other uh, uh, domestic policy changes. But it ne really needs to be a fundamentally different model that starts from a different objective of does this meet the needs of the people in the countries that are signing the agreement? And so if we can take, so, you know, and I see the WTO a little bit like that. The, the mechanisms don't work. 
Uh, you know, obviously the labor piece isn't in there. So we can, you know, attempt to tweak, and there's a lot of people working on that and dealing with data issues. And But I, I, I absolutely think we need to be thinking of multilateral approaches because it should not just be the U.S. going on its own. We need multilateral approaches that deal with the current moment and the future moment that we're all anticipating um, and make it multilateral institutions that have different objectives and are fit for purpose for this current moment. I'll, I'll focus on my narrow uh, in China issue. Um, so I think the next administration will have to make a, a rather fundamental uh, choice. Uh, choice A is that if you are going to continue with a policy uh, essentially based on U.S. unilateral pressure against China, you're almost necessarily going to want to hobble the WTO dispute settlement uh, because in most of the cases China would win uh, because you are essentially saying on your own, we're not going to follow our WTO commitments because we no longer believe the gains from trade are symmetric, uh, but you haven't sought to make the narrow legal case that would support those actions in the WTO. So you're faced with a series of cases which you will lose. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to pursue that strategy, and there is an element, I think, of, of validity in the strategy in the sense that China does deliver subsidies to industries in ways that are not WTO violations. Uh, the WTO does not preclude big state investment funds making investments as long as those investments are on market terms. And how can you prove that, say, the big chip fund, which is supporting China's semiconductor, isn't making investments on market terms? You can't right now. You have to build that case over time. So there is no current case. There may be a future case. And then you have to wait until you've shown injury, by which time, given the scale of funds that China has mobilized, China will have already built a semiconductor industry with implicitly subsidized funds. It will already have built an aircraft industry with implicitly subsidized funds. So you could fairly say, okay, we're going to front run this process. It's unfair. We know the results. We're not going to wait until there's demonstrated injury. We're just going to act now. I think that was the, the gem of truth in the Trump administration's approach. So, you know, that's strategy A. Um, but you're outside the WTO. You're gumming things up. Strategy B, take the opposite course. Uh, and this is a strategy that I at least associate with Jennifer Hillman, uh, my colleague at the Council on Foreign Relations. It's the most aggressive possible version of a multilateral challenge. You argue that China's practices have nullified and impaired the expected benefits, and therefore, broadly speaking, uh, all of the members of the WTO would seek to push China outside of the WTO because the expected benefits haven't accrued. It's a non-violation violation case. It doesn't hinge on getting a remedy for a specific violation. That would mean the WTO would become important. Um, and you would seek to renegotiate, in some sense, the terms of China's entry back into the WTO. Now, in that context, you probably want to do more. Um, but it, that's a context where you want a functioning WTO, but a changed functioning WTO. Um, I'm curious if there are other big options out there for approaches towards the, the China policy challenge, but those strike me as the big strategic uh, choices. I, I think um, if I can push back a little bit on, on Beth's premise respectfully, uh, I, I think progressives should hesitate to attack international organizations uh, like the WTO uh, because I think that um, – we have an interest in protecting and preserving international order and multilateralism. Uh, it seems to me that the dispute uh, settlement process in the WTO, is, as it is flawed, um, is probably um, less imperfect than any other international dispute resolution mechanism we have. Um, uh, my friends in the human rights field um, are envious of the fact that there's a much higher degree of compliance with the decisions of the appellate body uh, 
than there are with decisions of, of, of uh, uh, human rights bodies uh, internationally. What I think, in fact, has happened is um, that the WTO is becoming less relevant in the world. For a period of now uh, more than two decades, um, we have seen essentially uh, no progress in the WTO. Uh, and, and, and what has happened instead is that we see growing numbers of countries joining free trade areas and customs unions. I think that is, in fact, the future model. I think what we are going to start to see is larger and larger circles of countries intersecting with different, um, uh, different degrees of uh, uh, economic interdependence. And I think that, therefore, trying to focus in on um, uh, agreements like the TPP or the TTIP um, and trying to get those agreements to have in them enforceable labor and environmental standards is a much more profitable way for progressives to focus their energies. Um, one of the issues with the WTO is the view, and I'd be interested in your reaction to that, that because the dispute settlement system has been used to achieve outcomes that, that were not available during the negotiation, and trade remedies is one of them, particularly zeroing, that is why the negotiating arm has been stymied. So that the dysfunction at the WTO on both sides, people will say the dispute settlement system is the crown jewel. But if it's true that that is stifling the ability of the WTO to negotiate any agreements, what does that mean? Do you accept the premise and what do you think that means for the future of the organization? Well, I, I don't disagree that the, that the, that the, that the, that there's there are flaws there in the process. Um, I, I'm not sure, uh, it doesn't seem to me that the dispute settlement process is the biggest hurdle, but you may have more um, experience with that than I do. I mean, my ivory, ivory tower. Um, I, 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 uh, I, I perceive that um, there's, a, there's a possibility for some kind of a grand bargain to be reached uh, between um, industrialized, advanced economies like the United States and developing economies where we address questions about agricultural subsidies, uh, 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 labor standards, environmental standards, as well as dispute settlement, um, to try to find some kind of a common ground. I think that there is a potential for that. The difficulty that I see is that most of the industrialized countries have, like the United States, bicameral legislatures. And so constitutionally, constitutionally, we have a bias in favor of agricultural interests. Uh, in, in any bicameral legislature, where you have one house, uh, like the Senate, uh, which is chosen uh, uh, it, it, uh, for equal representation per, per state, you are definitely going to have an agricultural bias there. It's built into it. That's why France and Germany and the United States and uh, uh, Japan all have strong agricultural uh, uh, subsidy programs, despite the fact that we don't have very many people who actually work on the farms any longer. Um, that becomes a problem. And so I think that that hurdle has to somehow be removed in order for us to reach the grand bargain that I imagine is possible. You're sort of bringing us into back to sort of a big picture item, which is um, if we're talking about the WTO, if we're talking about regional trade agreements as the future, you mentioned TPP, you mentioned TTIP. What is the purpose of U.S. trade policy as we move forward? Yeah, I mean, I think I've already said, I mean, I think that we need to rethink what the purpose is. I mean, both if we don't get it right, as you've already mentioned, you know, the economic, uh, the failures have real political implications that we're seeing all over the world. I think you need to reconnect. Why are we trading? You know, we are trading not just uh, for short term, you know, profits. And that's another issue around China, the long term versus the short term, which I think is a huge issue that we need to look at. Um, so are we looking at trade policy in a way that says, are we building something that's sustainable, um, jobs with de decency and rights, um, dealing with the Paris Accord and the climate crisis where we have an estimated 10 years to seriously deal with things. Is that 
is that our model? Or are we continuing down a model that really has lost its objective, right? It's like, that's what I meant by papering over a neoliberal model that we just keep trying to add a chapter to and, and tweak and figure out a better enforcement mechanism rather than saying, let's take a pause. This current moment begs us to take a, a pause and say, what did we get wrong? We got a lot wrong, let's figure this out. And what is it that this, uh, whose interests are these trade policies supposed to be serving? Not just the government. It's or the elites in the, in the governments or the corporations. They're to be serving the people in those countries who've elected those people. Um, and we need to deal with the, with the environment in a much more serious way. I mean, you mentioned that there's labor and environment. What you have on environment does not even begin to get at the transformation that needs to happen in, in our countries. I mean, it, it's, it's a tweaking. Right, it's, it's looking at Peru and timber and it's, it's like little pieces where I, what I think we are all trying to get at is what are the systemic changes that we need to see? And trade policy is just one piece of it, although as I explained to my European colleagues, in this country it takes on a, a larger than life um, debate because we don't have the other domestic social policies um, that ease the blows of, of transition, right? We don't have national health care. We don't all of those problems um, that my European colleagues are, you know, shocked by. But that's why trade here becomes such a contested space, and so that's why I think we need to listen to why it's so contested. Get back to a new set of objectives, which are absolutely our members, trade unions. We need trade. We need successful companies. So we need that. We need that to flow. We need it to work. But it has to be in service to not just a few people up here. It needs to be in service to the people producing the wealth in the supply chains. I, I think that there's more than an economic justification for trade. I, I think the trade is important because I think it, it, we, are, we are global citizens, because I think it builds global institutions and global relationships. I think that it discourages uh, 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 military conflicts. It, it gives people interests in trying to trying to uh, maintain better relations with one another. Um, uh, and it also creates an instrument by which we can address some of the fundamental climate change issues that we all face. It gives us a way of trying to get countries on board with addressing the, the necessity for our survival of limiting uh, carbon emissions. So I see trade as, as a useful tool quite apart from the economic advantages that trade may yield. I guess, you know, trade deals today tend to be trade and investment deals. Um, and I think one important recognition is that sometimes on the investment space in particular, we probably push too far, constrain sovereignty too much. Uh, and so at least one, uh, I think, of the goals of a future trade agreement is not to overreach too much on the investment space. But I also think it, we need to think of ways in which trade agreements can reinforce reforms that change the structure of cross-border investment. And by that, I mean uh, the IMF and others have done studies that suggest that uh, the majority, at least, of outward U.S. investment is what they call phantom investment. It is investment in tax havens. And so when people think of foreign direct investment, they think of factories. Uh, but statistically speaking, foreign direct investment is ownership of shell companies um, and the intellectual property rights that have been assigned to shell companies in low tax jurisdictions. And so if you think, uh, as I do, that we need to reform tax laws uh, to change the set of incentives that have encouraged so much of profitable activity to migrate to the low cost, well, sorry, not low cost, low tax jurisdictions, then you would think also think about how those broader policies might be reinforced in your trade agreements. Sort of just, just to go back to TPP, which ties into all of these issues, it seemed to me that the argument started off as liberalization for liberalization's sake. And we were still at, this is sort of the shift, the beginning of the shift away from a neoliberal discussion. And when I was on the Hill at the time, when the economic justification wasn't there for it because of the content of the agreements, we don't spend enough time 
on actually looking at the content of the agreements and whether they serve the purpose that you're talking about, which is promoting peace and prosperity. Then the conversation shifted to TPP being about reigning in China. And again, if you actually look at the detailed rules, it's the opposite. It actually reinforces our supply chain dependency on China, and there are other issues with the agreement. The state-owned enterprise chapter is not going to do a thing about China. Um, so as we think about this, how do we choose our partners to achieve the goals you're talking about, Joel? And also, how do we make sure that the substance of these agreements matches up to the goals that we say these agreements are meant to serve? Okay. I still am I'm wounded from the TPP uh, <laughs> Sorry, <I didn't> discussions. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I, you know, uh, so we totally agree. You know, the TPP, I think, was really painful and got it absolutely when you get the economics wrong. <laughs> That's your, your last message, you get the politics wrong. Um, and I think it showed a, that there wasn't a clear objective, right? So for the labor movement, it was seen as the same old model, although we worked hard and there were benchmarks around Vietnam and there were discussion, but it still rested on political will. There was still nothing binding in there. And we were absolutely on the same page that this was not going to do anything around China. And in the end, you know, that's why, uh, you know, if people don't remember, we actually engaged for, you know, how many years? Five years, six years. I've seen some of my colleagues who have the same wounds. Um, I mean, we engaged. So it was not that we were no to TPP, which in a lot of people's minds, it was the labor movement was immediately no to TPP. We were engage, engage, engage for a long time to try to make it better, to try to really figure out was this going to serve the needs and the well-being of workers in all of these countries. You had issues of forced labor and supply chain in Malaysia. And we can get to that issue in a minute of solving how do we deal with those mechanisms. Um, so the, you know, the, the whole TPP construct, it was never clear what was the objective. What were we trying to do except a pivot? And that was you know, a pivot towards Asia and dealing, containing um, China. And we did not see this as being the mechanism of really um, addressing some of the systemic changes that needed to happen. Um, and so you know, people still lament that we're not part of that. And I still think it's a moment for us to, to really, again, um, it, it, that the, t the TPP will not like counter the BR, you know, the, the um, Belt Road Initiative of China and the industrial vision they have in 2025. I mean, so we're, we're trying to deal with these in enormous issues with these trade agreements, and it's just not the right instrument. You need different instruments. I'm going to make, uh, put two thoughts on the table. Uh, thought one is the obvious, which is that uh, if you, if the initial proponent of the trade agreement is a country like Singapore, which is well known for being a center for corporate tax arbitrage. Uh, you're going to probably, if you negotiate out from Singapore, you're going to get an agreement that is going to reflect the priorities of a country like Singapore. Um, and so to me, part of the architecture of TPP stems from the fact that it started uh, from a small set of countries with very particular interests, and then it expanded from there. So then the flip side of that is that if you want a different kind of trade agreement, you would be looking for a negotiating partner who is closest to you in uh, the areas where you want to make new kinds of commitments. And then once you've established your standards with the country where you're most likely to find agreement, on those standards, then you use that as the template for subsequent meetings. To, to follow on that, I, I think that rather than thinking about it in terms of choosing partners, I think we should instead say, what is the price of allowing countries uh, 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 to gain entry to our markets? Um, we have an advantage in the world. We have uh, uh, one of the l largest markets now, second largest market, and we, we ought to use that. We ought to say, uh, if you want to sell goods and services in our market, the price is you have to meet certain sustainability standards and certain labor standards. That's the price. Whoever wants to come pay that price, we're happy to do business with you. But instead of negotiating agreements and then sort of negotiating away our own standards, 
we should start from the basis of we have standards, you have to meet our standards or we're not playing. Beth, could I give a great yes, example of that? Because exactly. <laughs> I absolutely agree. Um, and yeah, Foxconn, great example, uh, looking to open up its market in Brazil. Yeah, and it was during the time uh, when there was a different Brazilian government that had a commitment to high um, labor standards. And they said, you're going to come into a market. You're going to respect the unions that are in those industries. You'll have higher labor conditions than you do in a lot of your um, uh, you know, production in, in China and other places. Then you have Foxconn come to our country, right? And you can see the same way. You know, We had a, a conservative uh, governor that, you know, to your point, Either you could have said, let's go high road, let's create jobs in Racine, Wisconsin that are going to be good, let's look at the water in the Great Lakes region and figure out is this a sustainable package, or you don't have that. Um, and it, 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 you really have those models. And do you think Fox come back away from Brazil when they said you will have a union? They did not. And you can see that with many multinational companies where they are absolutely anti-union here, but when the, com when the country says, here's our standards, and you'll play by those standards, um, oftentimes they're willing to play by those standards if they want access to that market. So I think that's a really, you know, we see those, that happening a lot um, with these major multinationals where we assume, oh my gosh, here in the US they would never do that. And then they go to countries like Brazil, uh, China, uh, and China says we want this, or you're going to pay money to ACFTU, and they do it. Um, so. do, do you think, Kathy, that the reason that, that, that we assume that they won't do it is because of the economic interests in our own country, which are sort of pushing against that? In other words, if we said you have to pay a living wage, there would be economic interests in our own country that would say no. Right. Our own country does not have that commitment. Our own country, I mean, we're trying to get uh, the PRO Act and labor law reform in this country. We, our country does not have the stated values for our economic policy that says we agree with high labor standards um, and, and um, dealing with our, our climate issues. That is not a stated objective. It's not a stated objective when we go to other countries and look to open up markets. It's not the stated objective if you talk to our colleagues in the embassies around the world. That is not what they have been taught, that that is the, the state of, um, stated mission. So again, there's a lot of room here um, to have a change in the way that we actually do business that I believe can be win-win. You can have successful companies um, with you know, making uh, money for its uh, shareholders and also making sure that the people producing that wealth are, are getting their fair share. And it, it definitely is possible when you look at the amount of wealth being created. I want to leave time for questions. So maybe I'll just make one sort of provocative statement and then we can, we can turn over turn over to questions. But um, I'm very interested in what you were saying, Joel, about the leverage of our market. And it's one thing that Elizabeth Warren said in, during the debates. Somebody said, well, how can the United States get people to comply with the rules that we think we want? She said, our leverage is our market. If you look at the proposals that are in the papers that were submitted, a lot of them are premised on some kind of international cooperation, but there are a lot of them that we can do without doing an agreement. So cross-border bargaining, we could find a way to do that. Better to have it an agreement, but we can do it on our own. Tim Meyer proposed a clawback. Um, we don't it's, it's another way of trying to accomplish what, what you're talking about. So there are a number of different tools that we can use without getting other people to agree to do them. I wanted just to flag the issue of forced labor because unilateralism has a bad name right now. And I understand why. But in 2016, we actually managed to close a loophole on forced labor. We did it on our own. We just went ahead and did it. You cannot import anything made in whole or in part with forced labor. And that's just a rule. We didn't negotiate it with anybody. It's just a rule that we instituted at the border. And now it is actually part of the USMCA. So sometimes when we act in a unilateral fashion, we're able to move the ball forward. And even though I think it's progressive, some of the problems for us, we know where we, our flaws are envir on environmental issues and labor issues domestically. Ironically, in my view, the United States is the most progressive country on trade. And I think that's something that progressives have a difficult time reconciling. So with that provocative statement, I will turn it over and see if we have any questions. They were told 
a low tax rate. If you want to produce in China, we'll give you a higher tax rate. But we've got to think how to re-incentivize these corporations as part of our trade policy to make it work. My view. So that's I was on the China Commission for 10 years. I saw this up close. I mean, that's a large part of why I've become so focused on uh, tax because I think there are components of our tax law, the new tax law, which give companies that don't produce in the U.S. a lower tax rate than companies that do produce in the U.S. There's a lower tax rate for the export of intangibles. So if you just due to the design in the U.S. and put the factory abroad, you lower your tax rate because you're uh, attributing the value only to your intangible design. And then the architecture of the global minimum tax, the guilty, A, it's a much lower tax rate. It's half the headline tax rate, so you want to pay the guilty rather than the headline tax rate. And so it incentivizes pharmaceutical and other companies to put production outside the U.S., intellectual property outside the U.S., and have an effective tax rate of 10 Whereas if they had design production all in the U.S., they would have no basis for not paying the 21 headline tax rate. There's another provision, which is since it's kind of complicated, but you calculate your intangible income, which is taxed at a lower rate, in proportion to the amount of tangible assets you have abroad. So if you add to your tangible assets, there's a deemed return on the tangible assets, and that gets deducted from your residual guilty tax, which is wacky. But it, trust me, uh, Rebecca Kaiser, if you want a citation, uh, you can reduce your global minimum tax on your intangible intellectual property by having a factory abroad. Mm -hmm. These are things that we have chosen ourselves and that we can change ourselves so that our companies uh, aren't encouraged in certain sectors to offshore production. I also think, in line with your point of view, that, look, we have to work, and it's going to be a long process, but we have to make it clear over time that the rules of the game cannot be that you can produce in China for the world market and you can produce in China for the uh, Chinese market, but you can't produce outside China for the Chinese market. Uh, th th that is a global trade that strikes most workers as unfair. Uh, but the net result of some sp the interaction of China's system and the existing WTO rules too often produce that result. Now, I don't know how to get from here to there, but I think that sh the goal should be that. Social dumping duties. <laughs> That's it. That's all. I mean, you know, that I mean, that is what I would what I would want to include in a TTIP or any other f free trade agreement is an agreement that everybody can impose. And by the way, I, I have friends in the European Commission, and I, we've we've talked about this uh, this issue, and they love the idea uh, of adding social dumping duties to an agreement with the United States because they said we don't pay our workers a living wage. Uh, you know, if, if you do that, we will make you pay your workers a living wage. And I said, great. So I know that we have very little time. Um, I'll add, because I have a whole list, so Heather, I'll give it to you. I, I have a bunch of ideas. I do want to, one thing we played around with in the TPP was this model, um, and I think, uh, shout out to Dan Maurer and his paper on transnational bargaining, because I think that's a really important concept that we actually played around uh, when we were thinking about, you know, I'm sorry, not TPP, TTIP.
You know, so that workers who are in the same supply chain working for the same company, how do you rebuild worker power and worker bargaining? And right now we have such a imbalance of information flows. Um, we will be putting out a paper about uh, European investment in the South that we'll get at this um, next week. But, you know, it's profound. And so the more that we can think about rebuilding worker power, both here and across the Atlantic, I think that is going to be key. You want to harmonizing upwards, I think especially with the Europeans, we have that um, opportunity to think about that. Um, imagine if a worker in Chattanooga had the same information as a worker in Germany about what the company's doing. And Heather is giggling because she knows this all too well, but that is not that complicated. And for Europeans, that's so normal, and we can't get it done here. Um, and so it, until you rebuild worker power on both sides of the Atlantic, and absolutely with our partners in Asia, um, I think that, you know, and I have a whole bunch of other things that I would include in that, but for lack of time, I mean, we need currency issues, rule of origin issues that need to be addressed, um, but we have our one minute warning, so I won't go into all of that. And I just, one last point I wanted to say is that how, you know, when we dream and think big, you know, things can happen. People thought we were nuts talking about investor state dispute settlement. Yeah. We, I can't tell you how many panels I sat on and people said, that's crazy, investor state dispute settlement has to be, we won't absorb the risk. How many, and I'm not gonna embarrass people, how many people agree with investor state dispute settlement right now, right? So w when we dare as a community to really put forward bold ideas, we can get there. Um, and so I really, I'm gonna end on my note of optimism about a new deal for trade. So I would tell the uh, gung-ho trader, trade agreement person to say, take a step back um, maybe we should condition starting negotiations, particularly with Europe, on some non-trade policies that impact trade balance. Uh, Germany really would like a trade deal with the United States. Um, I don't think we should negotiate German budget rules in the context of the trade agreement, but I don't see why we wouldn't want to try to use that as a tool to pressure Germany to change a budget rule that is increasingly uh, hurting Germany's own economy as well as the global economy. Just one thing really quickly. Yep. Um, <coughs> I think the simplest way forward, what normally happens is we're gonna start with the latest agreement that we did and the Europeans are gonna start with the latest agreement we did and we've already lost if that's where we start we need to reimagine the entire thing. So I find it uh, simple to just go back to the New Dealers. It was Keynes, it was Roosevelt, it was, um, it was Truman. And let's just start with the Havana Charter. We signed it, they signed it. It deals with competition, it deals with labor, it deals with the issues that we care about today. I mean, these people were true visionaries. So let's make it simple on ourselves. Let's start with that and add in climate change. And I think that's a much better place than starting with their, their deals and our deals. Well, thank you to the panel. It's a it's a, it's a fascinating time for trade policy. As Kathy, the question Kathy posed was sort of what are we, what are we actually trying to do here, I think is, uh, is a big and important one. And I'm impressed that Brad managed to bring German fiscal policy into the trade discussion. <laughs> but I shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> so we have a short break here. Uh, be back promptly at 10.30. You won't want to miss the CEO panel coming up.